Hello, everyone. Recently, I did an interview pretty extended. I think we went for about an hour and 45 minutes with Carrie Schertz. You might know him on YouTube as the Backyard Professor. Look him up. Subscribe to his channel. He's a fascinating gentleman. And I've done a few things with him before. We talked about a lot of things. He's very interested in Paul and my work on Paul. He was really diving into this book, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. And I'm going to do something specifically on this with him in the future. But what I had in mind with him in terms of Paul was actually taken from Paul and Jesus, which many of you are familiar with. Because uh, Carrie had taken the Mark course that I offer, and I'll put the link to it in this description. And in chapter three of this Paul and Jesus book, I've got a, it's titled Reading the Gospels in the Light of Paul. And I refer to reading the New Testament backwards that if you start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's first, that's the story of Jesus, then you get to Paul, you're actually going backwards. Now, I think many know that you're going backwards chronologically, but the question is, are you going backwards in terms of ideas? Now, there are people who would say there's no theological differences of any consequence in the entire New Testament, so there's a sense in which things aren't derived from other things. It's just different takes on the same basic revelation of Jesus Christ given to humankind now recorded in the New Testament. But as you know, scholars look at it more carefully. They don't believe it was just dictated. It's historical. The documents are historical. So it does make sense to look at things and be aware of their chronology. And so even though the New Testament was put together with Gospels and the Book of Acts, and Paul's letters and all the other writings, and then finishes up with the Book of Revelation, you could raise the question, which we got into at one point in the interview, I think it was about 40 minutes in, and you, you can find the interview on uh, some of his channels, The Complete Thing, but we got into the subject of, uh, is Mark really heavily influenced by Paul? And I would say yes, but I would even go so far as to say maybe Mark is not an independent testimony to a version of Christianity, but is actually a mouthpiece for Paul and his ideas that he's emulating Paul and repeating Paul. And even though Matthew and Luke use large percentages of Mark as a source, it doesn't mean that they also are incorporating the Pauline material in its uh, pristine form the way I'm starting to think Mark does. So we've got a Zoom meeting coming up on Sunday. That would be May 28th. This is, I'm making this recording in the year 2023. So if you hear it 10 years from now, the date won't matter, but the ideas will still be here. Uh, and one of the things we're gonna do questions and answers, and this is people that are enrolled for the MARC course. And if you do hear this before uh, May 28th on Sunday at noon, you can come to the Zoom meeting. Uh, you'll get an invitation. As soon as you sign up, I can get your email and you'll get the invitation. I'm going to send them out Friday, uh, tomorrow. Today's Thursday as I'm making this recording. So there's a segment of the interview with Carrie uh, where we really delve into that question. So what I'm going to do is append it to this video this little intro that I'm doing right now, more or less kind of live thing, just off the cuff. And uh, let that be kind of a beginning statement because I'm becoming more and more convinced that uh, New Testament theology as a whole goes back to Paul. Now it does get amplified, it gets elaborated. In some ways, Paul even gets countered 
many scholars would agree that Luke Acts, which you think would be in total agreement with Paul, doesn't really have much of Paul's theology. To get into that, you have to go kind of deep, and I'm not even going to try to touch that right now. But I think I am of that view that Luke, clearly the book of Acts, Paul's the hero, but the Paul of the book of Acts is kind of legendary, independent Paul that's coming actually from the author of Luke Acts, which is a two-volume work, as many of you would know. But what about Mark? I think Mark is rather pristine, rather un untouched in that sense. And I'm thinking he actually is a messenger of Paul. I don't mean historically. I don't know that the author ever knew Paul, but I think he's absorbed Paul's ideas. He's reflecting what we sometimes call Pauline Christianity. But here's the catch. If Mark is put into Matthew, 90% of Mark, and becomes the core story, even though Matthew has other materials, and he's also the core story of Luke, then there's a sense in which looking at Mark is going to give you a more original idea of how Paul was being, being interpreted in terms of tell me the story of Jesus. And I've touched on this a little bit in the Mark course, but this is a little bit uh, going off, uh, a bit further and actually seeing Mark as just a real mouthpiece in a more elaborated and official way. So give it a listen, see what you think. And in the meeting on Sunday, May 28th, 2023, the week that I'm making this, uh, I think today's May 25th, I'm going to bring this up as a question. Uh, some of the students, they've been sending in questions, and many of them will be in the Zoom meeting. They've asked things along these lines already, and so I want to address it. So I'm going to go ahead and put this up on YouTube, and everybody can hear it, whether they're in the Mark course or not. But I think it's something I want to explore more in detail. And some of it's in this book, but I'm expanding it as I go along here. So uh, uh, looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks. Yeah. Well, what I did want to cover, Kerry, is I guess you could call it the theology of Mark. I'm not big on the word theology, but what are the big ideas of Mark? And time and time again, he is reflecting Paul and the theology of Paul, particularly what we see in Paul's early authentic letters. And this would be uh, particularly first and second Corinthians like the divorce decree that's quoted in Mark, I think it's chapter 10, Paul quotes it verbatim, you know, whoever puts away his wife and marries another commits adultery and the wife puts away her husband, commits adultery. Uh, Paul knows this. Now, Mark is written later. So even on something as, as hmm. simple as that, uh, you know, just taking a topic. The big one would be the Last Supper. Uh, the Last mm -hmm. Supper in Mark 14, taking bread, taking wine, this is my body, this is my blood. Go to 1 Corinthians 11, it's almost just directly lifted from that. And wow. what is really amazing, and you know this from my Paul work, is Paul says, I receive this from the Lord, and I'm delivering it now to you, that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and so forth. So mm -hmm. how did Mark have this idea of what Jesus said on the last at the Last Supper? That's a private meeting of Jesus and the Twelve. So how does he get this? You say, well, there's probably a tradition going around of what Jesus said. Uh, not according to Paul. He said, I got it from the Lord, from Jesus. Yeah. Now, this goes into this Paul's ascent to paradise. Paul claims to have conversational revelations from Jesus of Nazareth. 
whether he did, whether he didn't, whether they're illusions or true revelation, you know, people have to work that out themselves. But he does make that claim. And then once Matthew and Luke follow that, which they definitely do, John doesn't, but they do. He doesn't even have a last, well, he does have a last supper, but he doesn't mention any ritual of body and blood. He takes it more metaphorically earlier in chapter six, kind mm -hmm. of, uh, I'm the bread of life. If you eat the bread, mm -hmm. you know, and so forth. Uh, but he does say, eat my body, drink my blood. So he, he's, John is influenced by Paul too. Everybody's influenced by Paul, let me tell you. And so that would be a big example. Also, um, Mark's Christology, his view of Jesus of Nazareth, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Uh, mm. People would think, and lots of people think this, I kind of changed my mind over, uh, over the years. Well, Paul would be very, very high on Christology because they always go to Philippians 2. You know, though he's in the form of God, he didn't count equality, God a thing to be grasped. Well, you, you know from reading my book, I argue that that is not about Jesus in heaven. Right. And many scholars have said this. I didn't originate this. I learned it from Charles Talbert, a great uh, biblical scholar. And he argues that it's an Adam Christology. And what does that mean? God creates the clay dust Adam, Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. Now he sent a form of that Adam, though he's in the form of God. Remember, Adam's made in the form of God. Yeah. But he grasps equality. What does the serpent say to Eve? If you'll eat this fruit, you'll be equal to God. So it's actually not about he's in heaven, he comes down to earth, then he goes back to heaven. Paul's Christology has to apply to you because you're not in heaven. You're not, a, I mean, some churches might say this, you're a pre-existent divine being and some people believe in reincarnation and all that. No, Paul has an Adam Christology. He believes that flesh and blood Adam beings, human beings, have the potential to become divine. Not just Jesus, but he's the firstborn of many brothers. Many brothers. I would add sisters, except it's not really genderified. You know, it has nothing to do with male right. or female. Now, we're not going gender here. There's no we? male or female. In but yeah. the idea is, well, we go to Mark, and what does he say uh, when someone says, uh, what is the great commandment? of the Torah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 8? For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and so forth. And one Jesus, the and Lord. The Lord Jesus, yeah, yeah. Through yeah. whom are all things, meaning the new creation through him. He's not saying Jesus created the world. Now, later Paul, there's early Paul, later Paul, and then really later, later, Paul, if you go all the way. Uh, but Colossians and Ephesians develop that. So the same thing happens with Paul that happens with Mark. Instead of just reading what Paul says when they're reading Corinthians, people go, yeah, but in Ephesians and Philippians, I mean, Ephesians and Colossians, oh. he says he existed before the creation. And he's the interesting. They, and they're they just read it that way. Well, wait a minute. Is that really what he means? And I think Mark is reflecting the same Christology as Paul. Now, this is a, this is a view I've held now for about five years. Uh, I did not hold it when I wrote my dissertation uh, to this extent. I don't think Paul thought Jesus was a pre-existent divine being. I think he thought he was a Adam who did not grasp for equality and then God poured out his spirit on him, and he became a servant. What does Mark emphasize throughout? Every time Jesus talks to disciples, be a servant, be least. you got to suffer. Don't tell me about the glory and the power. Take Don't, up my cross. And can I be in the kingdom? Can I be at the right and left hand? Can I be yeah. the first? It's just, it's wonderful ethics from Paul. <clears throat> Become like a child. Is, is. So you start reading Mark and you realize 
the message is actually, there is glory. There's no question there's glory in Mark. Uh, Jesus is going to be glorified. He's going to be raised from the dead in Mark. And he says that. Mm -hmm. But when they want to dwell on that power of, like the transfiguration, Mark 9. Mark 9, 1. Some of you will not taste of death till you've seen the kingdom come with power. Okay, and then they have a vision. And Jesus is shining and glorious and Moses and Elijah. It's like we're in the resurrection. We're in the kingdom. We're up on a mountain. High mountain, it says. Okay, that, Mark believes that will be later, but it's not then. And then they wake up, and they go, oh, wow, so we're, we're here, ready, let's go to Jerusalem. And he goes, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you want to go to Jerusalem? Are you sure? Because I'm going to be killed, spit upon, rejected. And yes, on the third day, God will raise me and glorify me. And if, but if you want to follow me, you too, as you said, have to take up a cross. Now, people today just read that like almost like, oh, yeah, yeah, we go, we really need to sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, come on. Take up a cross is not a metaphor. He's saying we are going to Jerusalem and you guys will be nailed up. And I'm going to be nailed up and you're going to be wow. naked. And just I don't know if I, could have done it. I mean, so do you want to follow? And each time he says that they they don't listen, and Marx juxtaposes their misunderstanding. And I can say this, I think, without fear of uh, refutation or contradiction. The disciples and Mark never get it, ever in Mark. And they run away at the cross, and you never see them again. Yeah. They all forsook him and fled. Yeah. And, of course, at, you know, Peter is at the trial and sort of lurks around. But I'm talking about they never appear like in Matthew, we're all on a mountain and it's all glorified right. now and it no, never. never. And that's why people go, Well, is the ending right? I mean, why why is that ending gone? Well, again, it reflects Paul. Don't be talk the glory's coming, but don't be talking about the glory. The glory is not the motivation. The motivation is become a suffering servant. Yeah. Mark is suffering servant. Paul is suffering servant. I yeah. even think, as you know from my uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, I think Paul found himself in Isaiah 49. Yeah, yeah, I thought that before, was interesting. Before I was in my, when I was in my mother's womb, he called my me mother's womb. and appointed me as a, a messenger to the nations, to bring light to the nations. What does Paul say? I was called in my mother's womb to go to the nations. So yeah. he thinks Jesus is the Isaiah 53 character. And he's wounded for our transgressions, the people of, of Israel particularly. And mm -hmm. he believes that he is filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. I know this is all new to people. It's not standard Christianity. But if you'll take it bit by bit, you know, read Paul as Paul, read Mark as Mark, and read early Paul, authentic Paul, the first. So which ones, which ones would you say are early Paul then? Second okay. Well, you could start with Romans. Just take the order. Start with Romans. Okay. First and second Corinthians. Okay. Then you want to do first Thessalonians, Galatians, and Philemon, and Philippians. Those are the seven. That's yeah, the early Galatians, Galatians and Ephesians are kind of uh, disputed. No, right? Galatians is okay. Totally okay. Oh, Ephesians, but Ephesians is the disputed. Right? Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, Colossians. Are cool. secondary, yes. Paul. Right. They still have a lot of Paul, but this other Christology has been overwritten. And yeah. then you get Timothy, Titus, and uh, so forth, those three. That's and pretty well... Later. A Pauline school, we call them the pastorals. And then you get Luke X and X is has Paul, but I call that legendary Paul. That's more that's not straight Paul. So uh but back to Mark. So Mark is actually reflecting the Pauline theology, which is really not that complicated. Do you remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer hearing I about do. him in World War II? He was a Lutheran pastor. Hitler gave the order that all Lutheran pastors must put a copy of Mein Kampf on the pulpit 
next to the Bible. That's for people who are too young to know. That's Hitler's autobiography. So you got to yeah. have the Bible up on the pulpit, every Lutheran church in the oh. world, and then you got to have Mein Kampf. And just and so uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a pastor of a Lutheran church. He's a minister. He goes in and he takes the copy of Mein Kampf and throws it on the floor and steps on it. And he says, this will never be on the pulpit. Let's hear the word of God. He's arrested very quickly after that, thrown into prison. Yeah. And he writes this book called Letters and Papers from Prison. And then he writes his masterpiece. It's called The Cost of Discipleship. It's mm. pure mark, pure mark. And what he says is, first line, when Christ calls a man, he calls him to die. Period. Whoa. Just like a crescendo. That's heavy, isn't it? That is heavy. That's now, heavy. I'm not a preacher. I'm not telling people, well, you better follow Christ and you're going to have to give up everything. But yeah. I'm going to tell you what Mark says. I'm going to tell you what Mark's Jesus said. And, you know, Bob Dylan has a song where he says, you're not him talking about Jesus, you know. Forgot which song, but he's talking about Jesus. And he goes, but you're not him. So, uh, you know, no. I'm not him. Uh, <laughs> Me, Nietzsche, but... Nietzsche also said there was only one Christian. This is Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche. There was only one Christian. He died on a cross. And what he was reflecting wasn't like you couldn't be a follower. But he's looking around. He goes, I don't see anybody doing that. You know, yeah. I mean... Churches are prosperous and you still don't. <laughs> you join churches to get business contacts. Let's say you're an insurance salesman. I'm not saying you don't have any faith, but it's a good social thing to do in our culture. I'd say you're better off joining a church. Your kids are going to be better off. They're going to make friends. You know, they're going to be taught these basic things. But what if uh, people came in with handcuffs and you know, guns, and we're going to lock you up and kill you, I think the churches would be pretty empty. So I'm not claiming any kind of moral superiority. I mean, I, I, I'm not planning on selling my house or uh, leaving my family behind, but Mark says to do that. So Mark is tough. Mark yeah. and Q, you know, Q are the that's, same. That's the Jesus. real Those gospel. are so you have to tough. Yeah. Uh, there's a man... Uh, years ago it was in the 20s i think bruce barton you might be old enough to know this the man nobody knows he was a businessman a salesman he started reading the new testament and he goes this is a what they're saying in church so he wrote a book called the man nobody knows basically just good sermon on the mount stuff and he said you know and it's 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 like a fictionalized kind of thing uh, about a man who says, I'm going to start doing what Jesus said to do. And all of a sudden, basically the society collapses because if you started doing what Jesus said to do, like nothing will work the way it works. You know, uh, if you have two coats, give to him who has none. Things like that. Yeah. Uh, bless those who curse you. You ever yeah. take somebody's parking place by mistake? Is that what you got? Did you? Get, yeah. Did they get out and say, "Look, that was my place, but don't worry. You know, you didn't see me. You might need it more than I know." This isn't how people behave. Some people do. Some people are trying to follow Jesus. Sure. But anyway, Mark is. Uh, I don't want to get into my preacher mode here, because I have a kind of professorial preacher style, but it has to do with don't misread this text and don't domesticate it. Don't make it into some kind of easy thing. See, I uh, believe in J Jesus and you've got it made. That's yeah, not and even then, just, you know, basically live your life. Everybody wants to have a good life and comfort and savings. And it's wonderful. I, I like that, too. Take no thought for the morrow, Jesus. Said. Oh, boy. Yeah. Sell what you have. That's, That's Mark. A, sell sell what, you have. what you have and give to the oh, poor. Boy. That's what one guy asked. You know, I'd like to follow he you. He did. Go sell everything. Yeah, and, and he, goes, he was doing I, everything up to that point. Yeah, well, all the commandments. Yeah. He was, hey, I got nine out of ten, but yeah. why did you give me that tenth one? <laughs> so I think Mark is preserving something, and I think the reason he's writing what he writes 
is he's concerned that the followers of Jesus are drifting into this sort of glory hallelujah mode. You know, hook your star to Jesus and you'll be heaven you'll be glorified when whenever you die or if Christ comes again and uh sort of like what am I gonna get if I do this? And what yeah. Mark is saying, what are you gonna get? Why don't you talk about what you're gonna lose? Because the answer is everything. Everything. And it's Mark Peter says, Lord, we've left all and followed you. Yeah. Now he does say in Mark, no one who does that will be without father, mother, brothers, sisters, lands, and so forth in this world and in the world to come eternal life. Because he believed, Mark believed, and it didn't happen, but he did believe that the kingdom of God was very near, at hand, literally, like your hand, you can almost, you can touch it. This oh, book is at hand. It's at my hand. I don't have to go across the room or downstairs to get it. The kingdom of God is at hand. And uh, it's near, even at the doors and so forth. You get Mark 13, very, very apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. This generation will not pass. Some of you will, who will standing Still here will good. not taste of death and so forth. So Mark is very apocalyptic. The other thing he does that Paul uh, hints at but doesn't fully get into is that the uh, form of the current dispensation of Judaism is passing away. And Paul gets into it a little bit. Like he says, uh, what's ready, what's, what's already here is ready to pass away. You know, it's already not yet. Right. But in Mark, it's real clear that I sometimes have said, and I, I've never heard anybody say this actually, uh, but I'm sure somebody has, that Mark is the first Jewish document, I'm going to call it Jewish for a minute, so don't jump out of your seat, those that are listening. The first Jewish document from the post-temple period. And it is proposing a new way to follow the God of Israel without the temple. All right. oh. You never hear that. You never hear that. Oh, what do we mean? Well, after the temple has gone, there's no sacrifices. There's no going up to the temple. And how does Mark end in chapter 12? There's a person in chapter 12 who's told you're not far from the kingdom. That's right. And that's, that's a key right. to the whole book. Because we're trying to figure out the secret of the kingdom. And he tells the guy, you're getting close. And it's an idea that he's beginning to get that if you love God, and love your fellow human being as yourself. This is more than all of this. And they're in the temple. And I picture him, he mentions burnt offering sacrifices. And then he tells a story about a widow with two copper coins called a lepton. It'd be smaller than even a penny. I've, I've got actual leptons downstairs in my collection. They're very small. Mm -hmm. About a quarter of the size of an American copper penny. And uh, this woman gives two of those coins. The disciples are all talking about the buildings. And isn't this amazing? You know, again, we're going to take this over pretty soon. Whoa, we're, we're going to sit on thrones and judge the 12 <laughs> tribes of Israel and all that stuff. And then he goes, did you guys see that woman? And they go, what, what, what happened? He said, she put in two copper coins. And she's a widow and she's poor. So I tell my students, she's got three strikes against her. She's she's missing the three M's. And uh, essentially, she has this faith that he says she gave more than all the rest. Oh, she has more than all the rest. Yeah, she gave her all. She gave her all, yeah. So uh, the thing is... Uh, that really inverts all of our values today, yeah, doesn't and it? And right after that, you know what yeah. the disciples say? As they're walking out of the temple, they look back from the Mount of Olives. You can look in the map in the course, and they go, look, Master, these beautiful buildings that Herod built. Well, Herod's a horrible person. Yeah. Jesus yeah. is just like, 
he's just he's got to be like ugh. Yeah, that, that's that's the famous I meme the face palm you, Jesus. I just told you what true religion is: a person sacrificing all they have. And you are still talking about the buildings. So let me tell you about the buildings. A day is coming very soon, this generation, and not one stone will be left on another of that temple. Won't even be there. And it's not. It's and not. It's not yeah. And those were some of those stones were like 10, 20 ton stones. That was yeah. not a small tent that Herod. Right. Now, there are foundation stones for the temple complex, but that's saying no stone on another. That's like, you know, people get it so literal and they go to Jerusalem and go, Dr. Tabor, what am I going to do? I see Herodian stones and one on another. Oh, and Jesus yeah. said there wouldn't be. It's like, you know, you say, uh, unfortunately, right outside my window here, our neighbor's house burned down last summer. It was just horrible. And you, you say, uh, it's burned to the ground. There's nothing left. And somebody says, wait, I see a concrete porch. Why are you saying there's nothing left? There's a porch left. This is ridiculous. What he's yeah. saying is it's <laughs> going to be totally gone. Okay. You don't have to get down to it. It's a saying, you know, I'm a, that, that's going to come down brick by brick. There'll be nothing left, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think perhaps Mark is trying to give in, in, in Jesus's words, the idea that this world is passing away and you're still focusing on that. That's right. That's the right. widow had part of the world, so to speak, two little yeah. coins, and she left it. She left it. And yeah. it's her act that means more than all these buildings. What I wanted to say is no man, first of all, she's a woman, not a male. Because if you're a male, you have power. She has no husband. So no, she she's not a male, M, M number one. She doesn't have a husband, you know. So no marriage. And no money. So those are, so Man, she's, marriage she's a picture money. in that culture of no power. No power. If you don't have money, you're not a male. You don't have to be married. But if you're a male, you can still have power. But if you're a woman, questionable in that culture so uh so yeah he, he's uh but what he's really yeah he's also against the traditions of men that's a big thing in mark uh mark has seen how the pharisees have begun to develop different kinds of traditions um uh picking grain on the sabbath chapter two chapter seven washing hands before you eat ritual purity that sort of thing yeah. Uh, Mark is saying, look, remember, ritual purity has to do with the temple. I know people follow it today, but what people forget, all of the rites of cleansing, the mikvah, you know, going to the pool and washing, that was so that you could go up to the temple. M many religions have this. It's not just the, it's not just, you know, the, the Jew, Jewish faith in the time of Jesus. Uh, there are many Greek uh, texts that talk. If you go to my uh, blog, jamestabor.com, I have some of these texts under. There's a heading called the Jewish Roman world of Jesus, and there's a pop down menu. You can read some of these texts where it's talking about Athena, and it says, No one can come to the temple of Athena if they have done this or that, and it's some of the same kind of ritual defilement, including usually it's sex, blood, and death. Right, menstruation, yeah. sex, having sexual intercourse. People think, oh, a woman has her period; she's unclean. Well, if a man has a seminal emission, he's also unclean. And right. unclean is a, not a good translation because we think of dirt. It's nothing to do it. It means you're disqualified from going up into the holy. There's the holy, and the profane, the normal, the everyday. And yeah. if you're going to enter the holy. You have to leave behind the signs of mortality, sex, blood, and death. So let's say you've gone to a funeral and you've been around the uh, tombstones and maybe even touched a dead body. You have to go to the mikvah before you can go then up to the temple. It's ritual purity. It's nothing to do with. So Mark uh, says, he, he says, basically, that's over. 
that's over. Uh, that's why I tend to think he's written slightly after 70 AD. He's, you know, having Jesus look forward to yeah. it. But I think he's right, because otherwise it would be irrelevant to say, right. uh, look, here, here's what defiles. You guys were worried about washing your hands or this or that. There even Mark 7 says about dipping your dishes before making sure they're kosher and you touch not, taste not, handle not, all of these rules of religion. And he says, well, I'll tell you what defiles is what comes out of the heart. And then he yeah. names 13 things that defile a person. So those are the defilements of Mark. And he would absolutely agree with Paul again. What does Paul say? When he talks about clean, unclean, going to a temple, eating this, eating that, that's not what it really is. It is, you know, the kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's not touch, not taste, not handle that, not. He's reflecting already what Paul anticipates while the temple's still standing. But Mark now is saying, yeah, that's Jesus that's, said that yeah. that was over. And by the way, uh, I don't want to give away too much of the course, but one thing I'll mention since I mentioned Mark 7, maybe whet people's appetite a little bit. Thus he declared all foods clean in Mark 7. It's not in the Greek. The Greek does not say that. Everybody quotes that. And even though the translations put in parentheses, people go, oh, don't tell me I can't eat my bacon. Thus he declared all foods clean. <laughs> He's not even talking about food. What he's talking about, it's actually a joke. It's actually a joke. I don't know if anybody would laugh. But he says, what goes into the mouth does not defile. He's talking about ritual purity. You know, if you say, well, I, I touched a cup and someone who had been to a funeral had touched that cup. And now I drank out of that cup. And so that wine or that beverage was defiled and now I'm defiled. He goes, no, no, that'll come out in the toilet. That's what he said. He says, what you're worried about will come out in the toilet. Now, now what it says literally is it goes into the belly. He gives you a little anatomy lesson. It goes into the stomach and then passes out cleansing all food. Clean, that's what it says, cleansing all food. Not it's Thus he declares in the body, he's making a joke. Like, you're so worried what you touched and you didn't wash your hands. Remember, it's washing your hands before eating. You say, well, I ate. Oh, you didn't wash your hands. Don't worry about it. When I go to the toilet next. So now a Pharisee would say, it's not that kind of defilement. It doesn't come out in the toilet. It's a ritual. He's, he, he's playing with them there. He's saying the thing you're worried about, the body takes care of. But here's what you should worry about. What are the things that come from here? And then he names these 13 things. Yeah. And those are Mark's ethics. And you know what? They're the exact list that Paul gives throughout his letters. Adultery. That's pretty good years. evidence. Yeah. That, yeah. They're, they're influencing. Yeah. I'll just read it to you. We'll give a little ethics. Sure. Lesson. Absolutely. Okay. Listen, does this sound like Paul or not? Here's, if you do these things, you won't inherit the kingdom. I'm quoting Paul. Uh, evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Sounds like Romans, uh, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, other ethical lists that Paul has in his letters. So Mark is, is reflecting Paul. And what happens is it's, it basically gets destroyed. And here's what happens. Matthew writes first. He incorporates 90% of Mark. So why do I need Mark now? I've got 90% of it. I mean, and he adds an ending. We're going to get to the ending in a minute because there's no resurrection appearances. You never see Jesus once he's dead on the cross. Last time you ever see him again. That's when the curtain goes down. That's when the curtain goes down. Yeah. Well, Mark doesn't have any appearances. No. In fact, in Mark, a young man, not an angel. There's no angel moving a stone. There's no earthquake. Mark is... Now, 
you can see how Matthew would think this is really deficient. It's not going to impress people. The women come to the tomb and they're told he's not here. You'll see him in the galley and then just run away and it ends. That's not very, uh, you know, that's not very edifying. We need that's the not glorious. <laughs> and we, yeah, and we need proof uh, that that he was raised from the dead. You see. And that's why so, the Gospel of John is called then, the Gospel of Signs. He shows those exactly. proofs. Yeah. And also in Paul, again, Paul's the same way. You ask Paul, what kind of a body is the resurrection body of Jesus? Because he said, I've seen the Lord. Yeah. Now, let's go backwards. He says, well, whatever kind of body it is, this is Philippians 3, I think 21 or so, it Whatever kind of body Jesus had, you will have when you're raised from the dead. And then he describes it. It's glorious. It's immortal. It's powerful. It's a life-giving spirit. It's not of dust, not flesh and blood. Makes that clear. That's yeah. the resurrection body that he saw. Spiritual body. Right. A spiritual body. And I'm not going to go by Acts here, but in Acts, it's a blinding light. Well, maybe maybe that is a tradition that's uh, valid. I mean, it kind of fits. You know, is that you would see something that is so beyond what he calls when he goes up to heaven, the third heaven and then paradise. He says, I saw and heard things unutterable. Mm -hmm. And that can mean either unlawful because he goes on to say, which are unlawful for a man to speak. Yeah. But unlawful can mean a secret, like it's forbidden. But things unutterable can also be this kind of eye is not seen, nor ear heard. Paul quotes this, nor has entered the heart of man, which what God has prepared for those that love him. Well, yeah. have you ever thought of that? If eye has not seen it or ear heard it then Paul's just told you it is not a physical body because he, oh, he's saying that it is an eye opener. Yeah. It, now, oh, the reason oh, people, go, the reason evangelicals go crazy over that is they say, so you're saying it was just uh, a spirit. Why are they saying just a spirit? Yeah, I was going to say, why the word if, just? If you can transform a flesh and blood human being because not just Jesus, he says he's the firstborn of many. Let's see anybody take a flesh and blood human being and go like, whoosh, and they become a life giving spirit, eternal light. Huh, yeah. 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 Uh, let's see you do that. So th to say <laughs> just as if that's not, it's actually the, it, according have, to Paul, I'm it's done. <laughs> it, it's the greatest miracle of the universe because God is actually begetting spiritual children into this glorified state. That's what Paul saw. Now, the problem that people have with that, they say, well, then how do we prove Jesus was raised? Because it's it's uh, like just a vision or what if he was kind of deluded or what if he just imagined it? Well, you got to decide that, I guess. What if he was? But the point is he tells you I have seen the Lord. And then you go, but well, what kind of a body? He goes, you fool. He says, you fool. It's a stupid, why are you, at, you asking me to tell you what the spirit world looks like? That's like telling a blind person what colors are. You say, well, what, what, what is red and green and blue? I say, well... It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not black. It's not white. They can tell you <laughs> what it's not, but that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you're blind, you hardly even know. You don't know white even. So you wouldn't right. even know black because you have to have the contrast to know that it's black. So that's like being deaf and trying to yeah, understand yeah. music. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Same thing. It's just an analogy. So Paul says, you know, God, everything has a body in the universe. If it's an entity, enti body means entity, means a mode of being. Okay. okay, so wind does not have a body. Wind is not an entity. It's a force. An entity is a defined thing. <laughs> In terms of the living creation, it would be a plant or an animal or a human or whatever. It's a defined thing. It has a body. Uh, a rose plant has a body of a rose. Okay. 
So mm-hmm. what does a glorified son of God look like? He goes, I can't tell you, but I can tell you one thing. God gives everything a body suited to its status, you might say, or to its purpose. Or its... So I don't think he's, I think he saw something, mm-hmm. probably heard a voice because later he does hear voices. Right. And maybe the book of Acts, I'm not saying all of Acts is wrong on Paul. Maybe that tradition would pass down that it was like a blinding light and a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm just saying maybe, because that could have got passed on. Well, it certainly changed his course. Who who are you? He's he's not going, (laughs) oh, I see you. Yeah, let me see your wounds. and No, it's not like that. It's not like the, no, uh, it is a glorified uh, body. So people get, nervous about this because they want to prove the resurrection as if a resuscitated corpse would be enough. Words, I want to know that he was put in a tomb, this crucified bloody body, and it came walking out later showing its wounds. Well, guess what? Uh, he would still eat and he does. And he does. So what happens after you eat? 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah, he's going to defecate and urinate and all that. Exactly. So all of a sudden, we don't have a transformed, uh, glorified being. We just have a resuscitated corpse. It happens all the time. Uh, You know what's interesting, Dr. Tabor, if I can just... uh, Sure. Go ahead. The way Joseph Smith got out of that... Is he said, and this is kind of a, it's yeah. kind of a creative sure, waste. Yeah. theology. He said, in in heaven, Paul said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but flesh and blood are not in the kingdom of God because blood is not going to be running through your veins. Spirit is going to be running through your okay. veins. Mm-hmm. That was how he kind of said. But is, but is it flesh though? Because flesh is like flesh. Yeah. Well, he. So Mormons. The, the resurrection uh, is literal in Mormonism. Do, do they believe that? Body. Like, yeah. let's just cut to the chase. You would eat, defecate in heaven. I know. I I get it. <laughs> with you. I know. Would you, and, would and you, how do you travel? You know. And would you have <laughs> sex and reproduce? Oh, absolutely! In Mormonism, without question, in in, in the kingdom, in the heavenly kingdom, or yeah, on your on absolutely. your planet, or wherever you are, yeah. Yep, yep. That's part of the. That's part well, of the. How is it different the from this world? Then it's just uh, more glorified because the Jehovah's Witnesses also picture. Remember that the people during the millennium are just you know they're human beings, uh, like you read in Isaiah when it describes the new heavens and new earth, it, it talks about people will plan and eat and have vineyards. And right. but they say that then there will be a group of uh, 144,000 that are the glorified ones. And the others are getting a chance to have that. Russell believed everybody would finally have a chance and right. then the dead are raised and they get a chance. And there's this hundred year period. Herbert Armstrong picked up on some of that. He with did. This stuff. Yeah. Uh, so well, I think the way Joseph Smith envisioned it um, is the glorification element is having your mortal blood replaced by immortal spirit, which immortalizes the body. I think that's his approach. But he did but present biologically it. that would not make sense, would it? Oh, sure it does. Joseph Smith said it just <laughs> fall. <laughs> Yeah, because I, we know blood carries nutrients and oxygen and cells exactly. exchange. But and spirit carries glory and eternal life. That's yeah. the life-giving spirit is how Joseph Smith would propose it. But it's interesting how he tried to get through that and yet keep the body. I was just well, showing what that. The, what the evangelicals say, uh, they just make an easy move. They say, well, for 40 days he stayed flesh and blood. Right. And then at the end of that, when he ascended to heaven, that's when he was transformed. And oh, so, that's... yeah, Paul saw the transformed body. He didn't see the physical body. Uh, and, but the physical body, you know, did come out of the tomb and walk around. 
But the That's thing is, for Paul, he remember he uses the term resurrection. He does not glorification. He says Christ is raised from the dead, immortal. So right. uh, I well, think if you go with Paul and Mark, this these resuscitated corpse thing comes later, and I think it comes for apologetic reasons, defending the faith. Because Celsus, for example, one of the great critics of Christianity in the second century, uh, he says, uh, remember, he's arguing with or origin rights origin. against Celsus. And he says, well, OK, you've got a bunch of hysterical women running around saying they saw this and saw that. And, <laughs> and he, he suggests, he says, how do you know they're just not deluded and full of fables and we have this in all cultures and religions and these wild stories go around uh, you know grandma appeared in the rocking chair and told me this and that and she'd been dead 20 years and you know he's he doesn't say that but i'm i'm saying he he just sure. says you don't have any proof and they go oh well, wait we have proof it's not just a visionary thing people touched him he ate and that that eating is really important for luke so is the Doubting Thomas touching. Touch Doubting Thomas, and then would you like some of this fish? Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, though, in Catholic, you know, I have a book on Mary uh, that I finished now. One of the things they say about Jesus and Mary, in later medieval, this would be church father, late church fathers and into the middle ages is they can't defecate or urinate because they're so holy, even though they're flesh and blood. And you go like, oh, what do you mean? And what they say is, well, they ate just the right amount of food, just the right amount of liquid that their body would absorb it all. So there was never anything that needed to be excreted. Oh, wow. <laughs> Because they couldn't imagine the Holy Virgin Mary going to the bathroom. It's like, oh, <laughs> don't say that. It's like thinking of your parents having sex. You know, when you're growing up, you go, oh, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> Not that image. <laughs> so, no. uh, and, and Jesus, are you kidding? You know, what is he going to go aside from the disciples and say, well, I got to. Now, Protestant, this is not. Catholics today, I'm sure, are much more along the lines of, you know, no, he was a real human being. And I think even the idea that he was a Jew is getting out there more. I mean, you think of the great Catholic theologians and New Testament scholars like Raymond Brown and so forth. They're, they're totally working in the same world I work in. Right. But I'm talking about the mythology of the Middle Ages. It just became crazy, you know. Yeah. Well, you know the you probably know the pro proto evangelium of James. What what a crazy yeah. name! Yeah, but, I know, right? But yeah, that's one of the later apocryphal. Yeah, guess what? Oh, Mary Virgin has Mary. the baby. Mary has the baby Jesus, but she's still an intact virgin. <laughs> and then when it describes it, it just says, "And the baby just like appears, and he walks over and starts nursing." Or maybe he crawled, but the idea you get is he just, because she can't let the baby pass through in a normal birth, because, uh, so I guess it'd be like a divine cesarean with no cut or scar, just like pull the baby out. Well, then Salome, her sister, is commissioned in this crazy story, in my opinion, to check. We got a baby. We got a woman who had a baby. Yeah. Uh, Mary, prepare yourself. I'm going to give you a pelvic exam. Seriously, this it doesn't say it. It yeah. says it says Mary, prepare yeah, yourself. Check her condition. Okay, that means get up on the bed or whatever, or whatever. Yeah. Get yourself, and she insert. It says she inserts her finger, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, it fire hits it and it burns up. She loses her hand, <laughs> and then uh, her hand is healed. Uh, out of grace, you know, sure. but, but the idea is that you doubted, you know, she yeah. is, she's still a virgin. She's yeah. never had sex. She has had a baby, but you know, that's, 
she's totally virginal, even as a, a woman with a baby. Now, when is the proto-evangelism? Oh, it's hard to date. Some people try to put it early. I'd put it as late as possible. It's such nonsense. Yeah. Uh, it's just... At and, least second and, century, wouldn't it be? Oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's in it, way in the second century. Usually... Yeah. All these dates we just guess at. Let's is see. that that issue became only prevalent. In fact, I, it'd probably be further than the second century because those issues weren't anywhere near the gospel. That's why when people say, "Well, the Proto Evangelium is," I'm not up on it, frankly. You know, I'm we uh, I've got the books here that would give the first. When did the Patristic Fathers first mention it? That that book. But yeah. um, that doesn't mean the version we have is second century. It rings to me like something much later because it's so crazy. Sure. I hate to use yeah. that word, but nobody. Yeah. I don't well, it's like that. those infant Jesus stories. Oh, yeah. You know, Jesus strikes. Strikes. My favorite is he strikes a kid dead. <laughs> yeah, he strikes a kid dead. <laughs> yeah. Making the clay birds is nothing, but you know, some kid did something, he goes, Yeah, die. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, yeah, interesting. So, uh, that kind of stuff develops, but um, um well, one other thing I wanted to just briefly touch on, and this kind of jumps us back to the beginning of Mark, one of the much more interesting uh ideas, and I'm and I'm intending on looking into this a little more is. Uh, it was in Mark uh, where the first couple of identifications of who Jesus was was not given by humans. It was given by the demons. Yes. Jesus yes. immediately silenced them. Yeah, that's another motif. I of, thought that was remarkable when you bought yeah. the... I've, how many times have I read the Gospel of Mark and I did yeah. not realize Well, it. there's a secret throughout Mark until a certain chapter. I'm not going to tell you what it is because that's part of the course. you got to kind of figure that out yourself as you take the course. But there's a secret in Mark. Uh, and... The idea is don't tell who I am, don't tell what I've done. So even when he raises the dead, puts all the crowd out. Yeah. Like Peter, James, and John in an inner room and ra raises the little 12 year old girl mm -hmm. in Mark. Mm -hmm. And then he says, strictly charge them, don't tell anybody. Well, yeah. this is like, who would ever do that? I mean, Matthew and Luke are reading and they go, what? Yeah, we're of course we're going to tell people, Jesus he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he walks on. We're going to tell everybody. Man, in our day and age, it would be all over the internet. See, Mark wants you, Mark believes that Jesus did all these things. I think the author probably believes it. I guess he did. We can't judge. We don't even know who he was, but he probably believed it. But what he's trying to get across is that's not what makes Jesus the Christ. Not the, the power and glory to do miracles. What makes him the Christ is dead on the cross. So finally we get the final scene of Jesus alive. Okay. And a centurion Roman at the cross says, truly this was the son of God and he's already dead. So what you're doing is you're saying he gave everything down to his very last breath and that's the son of god now people say uh, well did he really mean it or is he being sarcastic and they come up with all these theories what perrin taught me my teacher and i pass it on in the course because i think it's very convincing i don't want to give it away but i guess I, I did jump into it a little bit is it's all good is you've got to realize if you're going to follow Jesus and say, oh, he's the Christ, I believe in him, that will be you. And it's, oh. Truly, this is the Son of God is, is because he did fulfill yeah. what you have, what is expected. What you have to do, yeah. You've got to yeah. give your life as a ransom for Oh, me. you want to talk about your belief? No, show it. Show it. Yeah. And with suffering. And this is Paul, too. 
when he this, the, the, mo- the biggest chapter Paul Paul, possibly talked about suffering, getting yeah. stoned and bit by the snake and beaten when I'm all that shipwreck. The, the main passage for Paul for glory is Romans 8 that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed. But then as he describes it, then he says, provided that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. That's Mark right there. That's Mark. That's Mark. So Mark is Paul. I mean, I don't mean Paul wrote it. No, Mark oh, right. has absorbed that message. And he is so concerned that the church, as we call it, or the movement, is drifting into this power and glory and what Christians do today. I mean, when evangelicals stopped me on campus, the Campus Crusade people and all them for spiritual laws, uh, it's like, uh, if you were to die tonight, do you know you would go to heaven? Absolutely, do you know? And you go like, yeah, most people. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Well, did you know the Bible says all have sinned? Have you ever sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? None is righteous, no, not one. Uh, So it doesn't matter uh, if you are trying to be a good person. We've all sinned. And guess what? Only through the blood of Christ can we be saved. Would you like to accept Christ now? Here's the sinner's prayer. Let's read it together and bow our heads. And and you, you then will have the glory of heaven. It's guaranteed. Christ promises it and so forth. I'm not say I'm not going to character them and say that they say you can go live a wicked life. They don't say that. They believe you should change. But sure. notice the appeal is not like, would you like to begin really following the ways of God? Because I need to warn you that if you do, like Jesus, you will end up with a lot of suffering and and probably death. Because this world does not tolerate speaking truth to power for very long. And we know that all over the world where people are jailed in many, many countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Fortunately, in the United States, we have a few more legal rights, but there's plenty of injustice Plenty of racism, people arrested, evidence planted. I mean, you bet if if you get out of line in a big, big cultural way, you'll be taken care of, believe me. You will be taken care of. And people reminds me of the Pista Pista Sophia when the the risen Jesus or or the uh, books of Yehu, uh, Justin Sledge, the uh, esoteric Mm -hmm. YouTuber, calls it you. I've heard it called Yehu. It might be. Yeah. But anyway, um, Jesus tells the apostles, and it's right up front uh, in the front of the book. I've got the Coptic, the German, and the English. Thank goodness I've got the English translation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He says, you have to learn how to crucify the world, yeah. or the world will crucify you. Yeah. I'm not going to teach you how to crucify the world, but the way he does that is, yeah, through, through the ascent, you know the ste- the mystical steps, the, much like what you talk about in the ascent to paradise. A lot of the yeah. sort of the talks right. about that too. But even Paul, at, after after he ascended and received that utterly unutterable, spectacular view, I'll call it. I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but and then when he comes back, he says, "Yeah, but now I have a thorn in the flesh." Suffering. And he asked the Lord to remove it several times, didn't he? Three times, yeah. Three and times. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. There it is. Right yeah, there. yeah. From right. Jesus. From the Jesus. Heavenly Jesus said that. So yeah. he's still talking Mark from heaven. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, be careful if you say, well, I, I want to be so righteous. I want to, you know, I want to see heaven and all. Yeah, well, go easy. Hold on. We don't know what that thorn of the flesh is, but boy, howdy, I don't know if I'd want a thorn in the flesh. I've had splinters and those are bad enough, slivers and stuff, but yeah, I know that's not what Paul's talking about, but. No, we're not sure what it is, but it, people speculate, but whatever it was, it does sound like it says flesh. He also calls it a angel of Satan or a messenger, but it is the word angelos. 
Um, so oh, it is something it's very uh, formidable. It's not just, you know, oh, my back kind of hurts or something. No. Well, uh, yeah. He does say it was given to me. So people have suggested, well, maybe, you know, he was stoned and beaten and maybe he's all disfigured and he's partly blind. And But no, it sounds like something happened. All the, I think I list in the footnote, 42 different ideas on what it is. Yeah. But yeah. what people forget is he doesn't say over the years I have had this happen. He said, I had this one experience and to keep me from being exalted because it was the highest experience that you could ever have of right. any human being. I think he means that he basically was exalted to heaven. Well, he says that, but he experienced the glory. It was, as I say in the book, it was a foretaste of the glory that you're going to get at the resurrection. Yeah. And then he says, to keep me from being too exalted by seeing that, I was given this messenger of Satan. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it's something well, I mean, back then, you know, started you... hurt. It started bothering him right then. So yeah. some people have said that, you know, one of the worst things you can have, you know, pain is bad, but uh, people talk about migraine headaches or something like that, where you just close the doors. If you even hear the sound or see light, you just, so maybe it was something on that level where he just, yeah. it really, it's really bad suffering, but yeah. it doesn't sound like a disease or an injury. It, it sounds does. like a thing he's feeling, uh, pain, you know, pain. Yeah. And and it's called weakness. My strength called, is made perfect in weakness. In weakness, yeah. See, that's the that's that idea. The widow gave everything. Her yeah. strength was right. Her, she's the weakest of the weak in right. that society. Right. And yeah, it, it's so interesting how it how there's so a, I'm gonna wind this up. Let's see, we got okay. an hour and forty. Yeah, we're doing okay. I wanna I wanna go. Uh, I've got to do some other things tonight. is the urban capital of the entire Galilee.